Okay, so uh, welcome to lecture one. I'm just going to summarize some points from that. I do have the, um, the PowerPoints and notes, and some of them sort of overlap with some other chapters. So you might be confused at first, but all of the things talked about in the initial lectures are from uh, the first few lectures in the syllabus. You can get an idea of how a real estate transaction <coughs> works by reading through the chapters. Some of this is very basic information for people. Uh, but uh, the lawyer does not act for both sides of the transaction because that's a conflict of interest. So you're not either acting for the seller or acting for the purchaser in the real estate transaction uh, because of the professional obligations of the lawyer to um, look after their client's interests. Um, people sometimes think that they can sell a house or buy a house if they don't need a lawyer, uh, but there are problems with respect to contractual interpretation. And what you're hiring the lawyer to do is to provide an, an opinion on title. So they are searching uh, title, giving a uh, professional opinion as to whether there is what we call good and marketable title. Good title means that when you go and sell, um, that you don't have a problem with selling, uh, that uh, the deal will close because there are no construction liens or uh, court orders against the property or other types of statutory liens like unpaid taxes, unpaid some of the unpaid utilities. And so the lawyer is checking into those things. By marketable, when we say good and marketable title is what the lawyer is, is certifying to the client, that when they go and s sell, they don't uh, have, a, have a property that is unsellable unsell or that uh, no one will close with them because there are issues pertaining to title. Uh, the that's the lawyer's role. The lawyer is, has an obligation to supervise the law clerk at all stages of the proceedings. Um, there's often a lot of delegation these days because the profit margins in residential real estate transactions are very slim, but it's ultimately the lawyer's insurance on the line, the insurer's, lawyer's professional responsibility to adequately supervise the law clerk. Um, a good law clerk is, is worth the lawyer's weight in gold, one who knows what they're doing and also what knows uh, when to go to the, to the lawyer. I have posted a, a video on my YouTube channel, an interview with a law clerk, um, Laura Level, and she kind of explains what she does during a day. So I advise you to have a look at that uh, clip, uh, talk to a real law clerk, and she stresses the fact that you know, she knows when to get the lawyer involved. The lawyer is obviously reviewing the title search, um, signing important letters, like the requisition letter, meeting with the clients to close, um, going over thing, critical documents like the mortgage, um, interpreting the agreement of purchase and sale. This is, would be the lawyer for the purchaser. Lawyer for the seller, and when you phone around and get quotes on fees for buying a house versus selling a house, often the lawyer's fees are a lot less with respect to selling a house because there's less documents that they actually look at. But they do are, again, interpreting a contract. Um, they're having to review documents. There are documents that are exchanged. Uh, there's bills of sale and warranties, all of which will look at these things at, at the end of the course, preparing the transfer. Uh, and the lawyer for the seller is dealing with the biggest issue, monetary issues, dealing with discharging the mortgage on title either prior to closing or in certain circumstances after closing. So they've got uh, things to do, and they've got to answer the requisition. So if there's problems with title, um, it's, uh, it's the lawyer for the seller who's, who's running around trying to give good title uh, to fix the title problems if they come up uh, during the title search and the lawyer for the purchaser requisitions that. Um, many people think that um, title insurance has replaced the lawyer's role in the transaction, but that is not really the case. Uh, uh, the lawyer is still having to do uh, to search title, to search the publicly available records, and give a opinion to the title insurer before they will in, uh, issue the title insurance policy. So what title insurance does, and we'll talk about it extensively later in the course, is that title insurance eliminates certain disbursements, certain searches um, where the title insurer feels that the risk um, of something coming up on those search compared to what it costs the lawyer to, to do them is something that they're prepared to cover. 
uh, meaning there's not a whole lot of risk that will come up. But there is a basic title search uh, done, and any um, and any searches eliminated are specifically listed in the title insurance policy. Um, and we'll get into title insurance later, but uh, many lawyers like to do like to have title insurance and do a full title search even if they're disbursements in order to best protect their clients. It's really depends on what the uh, lawyer discusses with the client and how particular they are about uh, making sure that there's no problems with title. Because title insurance doesn't prevent you from having a title problem, it insures against the problem, um, but um, it's like uh, life insurance or medical insurance, disability insurance, you still want to be in good health and not have to claim under the insurance policy and take things to make sure that uh, you are in good health uh, so that you don't have a claim. So uh, many lawyers are particular in that regard. Um, for the uh, acting for the, the bank, um, the bank requires before they will lend money to a purchaser, they'll give a preliminary um, agreement to loan uh, the money and it'll be conditional upon the title search being done. So the bank, before they're going to put money into your house, if you're buying a house, they want to make sure that you have good and marketable title because they're investing all this money in the house. So they actually instruct the lawyer for the purchaser on um, uh, with respect to the searches that they want, survey requirements, whether or not they'll accept title insurance in place of a survey. Um, but they want good and marketable title also. The bank has its own legal department, and for every real estate transaction, they could search title on their own. But they would just be passing those clients on, the, passing those costs on to their clients, and adding it to the cost of the mortgage. And it would be uh, an identical title search to the one that the lawyer for the purchaser does. Uh, in any event, um, so it would duplicate it. It would duplicate the cost. So what happens is the lawyer in a resident typical uh, real estate transaction uh, where the buyer is getting a mortgage is acting for both the bank and the client. This raises a professional responsibility issue, potential conflict of interest. It's not a conflict of interest at the outset because both of the parties uh, have the same interest. Bank wants good and marketable title. The buyer wants good and marketable title. But because the lawyer is acting for both parties, if they receive some confidential information from the uh, client about the property, there's a problem with the property that the client becomes aware with, aware of. Uh, let's say they find out that the deck is illegal or there's no permit or something like that, that. That has to be passed on to the bank. Or if the lawyer finds that in the course of making inquiries, uh, they cannot on the instructions of the client say don't tell the bank about it because they'll pull the financing or this may jeopardize the deal. The lawyer's under an obligation to tell the bank because they're acting for both sides. Um, and so this is one of the things that the lawyer explains at the outset to the client and they have them sign a joint retainer agreement um, whereby they agree that they understand that the, that the uh, lawyer's acting for both the bank and the buyer. Um, and um, that they can't keep any information confidential. Some lawyers get into trouble when they forget that the faceless institution that they only sort of deal with uh, when they get their package of instructions is their client and they have an obligation to them and, and there have been situations where lawyers have gotten into trouble because they have not protected the interests of the bank, um, sometimes because of the of relationship with the client. So. Lawyer has to be aware of that at all times, and the, and the law clerk should be aware of that as well.